All right, everyone, welcome back to CIS 125. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. As a reminder, you're not required to turn on your webcam or microphone if you don't wish, uh, because the class is being recorded. So we're on week four. We're on day one, week four of part one of our two-part sequence of classes, right? CIS 125 and 126 together add up to the certificate. You need both those classes if you're trying to get the certificate, because obviously if this is the last week of part one, we still haven't learned everything. We're getting into the animation portion of things, uh, which we'll start with today. So obviously if, you're, if one of the big things you're gonna do in this class is you're gonna make an animation as well as a game, that's why we have the full summer as part one and part two. It would just not be possible to do everything in part one. So we'll get to that as we get to it, but we're on week four. Briefly, I will look at these items here. They've been available since this morning. Um, but it's just a reminder that this is part one of the class. Next week, we'll begin part two, CIS 126. It'll just be another of these Canvas classes. Yeah, contrasting the 125 class here, there'll just be another one. And it'll be the same format with the welcome message and the readings and assignments and all that stuff. It's just divided into its own uh, class. You'll still be able to come back to part one, of course. Canvas part one will still be available for you to refer to any of the recordings, any late work. I'll still take late work even when the class ends of part one. Then in part two, it will continue learning our concepts. But before that, for this part, um, we're gonna look at another one of the artistic aspects of this class. Obviously you're seeing that this is a very artistic class visually artistic, but we're also going to add parts of writing, storytelling, and such. So we have biography, we have a script assignment that's uh, going to be for this particular week. Um, concepts about the background, the information about your character, and short form story creation. So a couple of assignments on that, as well as more that we'll talk about. As usual, Monday and Wednesday is the, is the class. Wednesdays is the day that we have the lab time. If you stayed on Wednesday lab, lab time, you saw how helpful it was to just keep working. Because when it gets to this artistic stuff, the more you work on it, the more you complete it, the more it's polished, the more you get better at it. So two assignments this week. I'll cover that in a moment. Resources. There's a bunch of links here. So let me jump to the second part first. Um, earlier in the day, I said, okay, uh, you need headphones today. There's a few videos and such. Uh, I think I'm going to put it in at a certain point in the in the class time. I'll, I'll probably put it in to look at the videos. Uh, some of them are short-ish, six minutes some of them are long, 24 minutes. So I'll probably put in like maybe half an hour a little bit later in the class. So this is, um, I wanted to give a chance at the beginning to first think of a character, think of backgrounds, create whatever you want, maybe without a lot of guidance uh, in the form of the content, but guidance in the use of the software. You got some of that. Now, the theory of a good character or a good background and those sorts of things, that's a more complicated thing. That's a kind of like a checklist of things to do to learn and such. So I'm kind of doing it a little bit backwards. I didn't want to kind of box you in at the beginning about here's the theory of making good characters, now make one. No, I just wanted you to work on your own ideas first without restrictions, without kind of knowing the rules and such. And then now we're going to back up and it's also going to be an extra credit where there's some videos here for some, from a really cool YouTube channel, BAM Animations. Uh, this is a couple of people that actually work in Hollywood, that work in real animation at the moment with a YouTube channel giving all of this great tips and advice, such as good versus bad character design, tips and tricks. Now this is 20 minutes long and... Um, the the duo in here go into breaking down a variety of characters, what makes them good, what makes them bad. And what I like is what they, all, they also do, you can submit to them, here's my character, what do you think about it? 
And then they'll kind of give ideas on here's how you can improve it because we work in the industry and we know what we're doing. So a fun series of videos. They also have another one here that I put tips for drawing backgrounds. Again, you did an assignment, do a background, but I didn't kind of give you like the rules, the do's and the don'ts of it. I wanted to keep it open for you to kind of work in your own way. But now then here is a video that goes on to give you detail about here's what you need to think about if you're doing this for real in the real world in a real project, especially like a real, you know, TV show, streaming show, et cetera, from real professionals. In addition to that, there's painting the background. Uh, there's this walk cycle. Well, we're obviously going to be doing animation in this class. And I'll guide you through it using Animate, but they've also got some good videos on that. One of the big ones is how to make a walk cycle, how to make a character look like it's walking. This one's only six minutes long. And then um, how to start animating your character. That one's 16 minutes. So long videos. They're going to supplement what I'm going to talk about, of course, hands on what I'll show you. I'll put a little bit of time later on to, for you to pick to watch any one of those. But then on your own, you should watch them all uh, to give you the, the best, um, uh, the best uh, knowledge about these topics. Now, notice here, there's also extra credit. For extra credit, what if you refine your character based on the videos below, like maybe the good versus bad design? What if you resubmit it? Maybe you've created a better character than you did version one two weeks ago while learning a few more of these do's and don'ts and tips and so forth. And the way to do that extra credit is when you submitted your character back on week two or one or whatever it was, you can just reply to your own, um, to your own original post and upload the new version of the character, like a brand new turnaround model sheet or color model sheet or whatever one extra model sheet you want, probably the, the turnaround one. So after you learn a little bit more of these tips and tricks, there's some extra credit here. I noted it somewhere else also, the extra credit, but basically you can get up to five points. You could get more points if you redesign your character now that you learn a few more tricks after watching the video. So the... Uh, the videos here, you do want to look at them at a certain point. Now, I'll incorporate some things in a lecture in a moment. In up here, I've also got these other links. So character biography and script resources. There's going to be two assignments this week. One is a public discussion, uh, and one is a submitted only to me uh, assignment. So this is going to be about writing about your character. You've already done a little bit about that on a previous assignment, but now it's going to be, need to be a little bit more refined. So again, I kind of did it in terms of letting you run wild for a bit on the first assignments and then kind of honing things in with rules and the like, structure and the like a little bit later to kind of refine things. So I've got a couple of examples here where writing about your character uh, we've got an example of Squirrel Girl and Atroticus, or Atrocitus, however you say this name. Uh, and so one is for Marvel, one is for DC, just to be totally neutral, okay? They're all good, everyone. We all love Marvel, we all love DC. No need to fight about it. So uh, we've got here this character, and notice this particular biography has more detail, perhaps, than the version one that you did for the assignment. Same thing with Atrocitus. Uh, contrasting this other character and how they wrote about it, background information. So that's going to tie into the assignment. There's plenty of more other examples of characters. And what I really like about any of this artistic stuff is you can get examples, you can see what others have done, you can get inspiration all over the place for your own version of things. I've got two examples there. You can go look at many other characters that you want to see. So these are big, famous characters from the two big, famous comic publishers with decades of backstory on some of them, some of them going all the way back, you know, to the 40s, some of them brand new in the last five years, what kind of backstories and characters are within these publishers, giving you ideas for, here's how I can do a version of my own biography for my own character. Part of the assignment will be to create a Drabble, which in short is a 100 word story. 
So a 100 word, exactly 100 words, the definition will be there. Go check that out. Some examples here. I'll show some examples from a previous assignment as well. So writing about your character, putting a story together, a beginning, a middle, and an end in a really compact 100 words. That'll be part of the assignment as well, as I'll further explain. And then a couple of files here for a storyboard. I'll explain that also. So all of these resources add up to the knowledge we need this week. In addition to extra things that I will talk about, these are the resources. Did any of you get a chance to look at these a little bit before class today? If you did, that's good. If you didn't, that's fine. Anyone browse them a little bit? A little bit? Okay. So if you didn't, there'll be time today, but you also need to look at these on your own in addition to what I'll talk about. Well, tangibly for the assignments, let's preview the assignments. And then once we do the main lecture, these will make sense. These will make more sense. This is a discussion, so it's a public post where your classmates will see your answers and you will respond to your classmates as well. Don't forget to do that part. When I was grading people on other assignments, they did a very good job on the posting part and then didn't reply. And that really hurt your grade because it is the two parts of this type of assignment, make sure you do both. And you can still do the uh, late work. I'll still take late work. So go back and do any late work that you missed, but make sure you do all aspects of the assignment. So basically here, create a post where you're gonna write about your character, tell us about your character, keep it of course safe for work. Uh, a short paragraph is fine. I've got examples back there on the resources. You could start with the one you did on the previous assignment. I guess you can copy and paste it in if you want to save time. I don't recommend that because probably you have lots of great ideas. You want to refine the character more. And shortcuts are often useful, but don't shortcut yourself on your artistry. Don't just take what you wrote for the previous assignment, cut and paste it in and move on. Maybe consider a new version of what you've previously written. Maybe just ignore it and start brand new now that you've been kind of in the class a little bit longer. So um, question here, are there late points for the uh, penalties for the late work? Yes, unless there is an excusable um, reason. So there's a question coming in on the chat here. So uh, whenever, for example, I got a family thing going on, can you give me a little bit more time? You know, contact me, we can work that out. Good. If people turn in late work for no reason at all, I have to assume that they just got lazy. So uh, yes, deduction. But when people contact me, let me know the situation. And if it's a good reason, yes, no, no uh, point deduction. Otherwise there is. But that's one of the pro tips in class or in life. Don't just fly under the radar. Talk with your boss. Talk with your instructor. Talk with your colleagues. The more you kind of um, understand each other, the better results you get. So don't hesitate to contact me on things or in, in the real world as well. But for this assignment, so um, you're going to write about your, um, your character in a, in a more full featured biography. Check out those examples. I'll show you examples from a previous semester as well. One moment. And then add to that. So this is two things. One is a little paragraph biography. Then one is a drabble. And like I said, a drabble is exactly 100 words. It's probably big and bold for a reason, probably grade wise. And I probably mention it more than once for a reason. So this, yes, will have to be exactly 100 words. If it's 101 words, enjoy your not perfect grade because I'm asking for a specific thing. But I have so much to talk about my character. Very nice. Enjoy your not perfect grade. And the reason for me to be stingy sometimes with some of these things or whatever the word is, again, who cares about a grade in a class? If you get in a job and the job requires you do A, B, C, and instead you do A, B, D, well, why would you expect a pat on the head if you didn't do it right as the boss was asking? And never mind in a class here, well, what happens? You get a bad grade? Who cares? In the real world, you get fired. That's worse than a bad grade, I think. So I'm putting in, in various assignments, very specific things for you to do. And if you do them, you should probably get a good grade. And if you don't do them, you probably won't get the grade of your dreams. And that is to simulate a bit in the real world that when you have requirements, do the requirements. 
the extra stuff might not cover the minimal requirements. So yes, I'll be counting the words or maybe use an app that does it. You know, we have technology. So make sure this is exactly 100 words. What I'm looking for is a place. Paint a picture in 100 words of a story. Where does this exist? Didn't you do just last week an assignment about a background? Isn't that a world that you're starting to create, an environment? So you have a setting that you can write about. You need one or more characters, probably the one you've been working on this class. Invent some new ones, sure. What is the conflict? Now, conflict's not the perfect word for it. What is the plot? It doesn't have to be a bad situation, but what is the what is going on? What is the action? What is the conflict? What is the quest that the character needs to go on from as far as battling the ultimate evil to go getting milk at the store? You know, what is the what is the point of things? What is the resolution? How does it end? What is the conclusion? Yes, I got the milk. Now I can make chocolate milk. Or yes, I defeated the ultimate evil. I got the ring. So in 100 words, you may add a title and it won't count towards the 100 words. You, know, you can call it Johnny's Adventure and then the 100 words, but make it a short title also. I'll show examples from previous students to show you that it's doable. And I know we're all full of ideas. But again, sometimes with constraints, constraints breed creativity. Constraints might feel like a problem, but then the solution might be a very good one, a very creative one. You can jazz it up with headings and colors and pictures and such. That's optional. But the text is the important part that will be graded. Post your story. You post your travel. Then you reply to at least one classmate by the deadline. What did you like? What could be improved? Again, respectfully talking to your classmates about it didn't quite make sense how you went from this point to this point. Could you elaborate? So what could be improved? Eligible response, at least one classmate. There's the grading. Don't forget to do those two parts to get full credit. The rubric over here tells you again. Here's all the points, how they're broken down. Make sure you do all of this for the full credit. I'll show examples in a moment, but let me pause here. Any questions or comments? Any questions there in the chat while, while we're here? Does that kind of make sense a little bit? It'll make more sense once I do the main lecture and show examples, but any questions? So... for the second assignment, and then I'll come back and show examples from a previous semester. I think it's very valuable to look at what previous students have done uh, to show you that they were in the same boat as you. They also took this class. They also had a large range of uh, talents, skills, and abilities. They also had a time crunch like you. They also had jobs and home stuff like you, and they also made it like you will. Okay, the second assignment is a storyboard, so a little bit more visual. That Drabble, you probably want to do that one first, that short story first, and then that'll guide you to do this assignment, where now visually you can kind of tell us or show us what the, what the Drabble was telling us. There's an article here to read on your own, but basically a storyboard is a graphical representation of a story, of a sequence of of, an, of events that will make up your project, whether it's a game or an animation. It can be very simple stick figures. It can be way complex. There's often a little bit of text accompanying what you're seeing. And I'm giving you the file here, either as the Adobe Animate FLA file or as a plain old JPEG. Here, you have the option that if you want to, if you have the capability, you can print out the JPEG and then on regular paper, you could do your storyboard on regular pen and paper if it's easier for you. You'll have to then scan it or take a photo of it to turn it into Canvas. You have to upload it as a, as a file on Canvas. That's one thing you can do. You can uh, print it out. Or you can open up the animate file and draw directly on the file there. You can type directly what you need to type as well because here 
ultimately what we're doing is all of this is adding up for one of the first big projects is a short animation, 30 seconds long. There's still more to learn. We're not there yet, but a 30 second long animation. And um, in the storyboard, maybe a title screen, a few action screens or shots. You need to fill out all eight of the boxes. Let me show you what the graphic looks like. These eight boxes with a little bit of space below to write anything you want. I'll show you how other students did it in a moment, but all of these boxes should be filled in. Um, any amount of detail that you want to put across your story, the one that you invented, that you wrote about in your Drabble. Um, you, can, you can do three of these if you want. You make copies of them and put together as many of these visual storyboards as you want, but at least one page with those eight uh, shots filled in with a little bit of text explaining what the shot is. Below in the text, write whatever is necessary. Like here's where music is playing. Triumphant music plays here, or sad music plays here, or from the point of view of the character. So explaining also in text what you're seeing visually. If you use the FLA file, you want to export it as a ping 24. We've seen how to do that before. If you printed it out uh, to draw it on paper, you need to scan it, take a photo of it, probably as a JPEG, upload that. There's the grading on that, 10 points. So yes, this week there are two assignments. One of them is focused on writing. One of them is focused on visuals. This is adding up little by little. I hope you're seeing in the grand scheme of it all of the whole summer an animation, a game. There's still lots to learn, of course, but it's all coming together. Uh, questions at this point on the storyboard, either here in the class or in Zoom. Any questions so far? Let me pull up some examples from a previous semester just to see how they did it. But better. So let me pull up the Drabble first. Let's have this earlier today, just a moment. So let's see an example here, just randomly picking someone. All right, so they've got their biography part of things, pretty detailed name, Hedgie the Hedgehog, nickname Hedgie or Triple H, hometown Hedgie Cave. Fresh foods, yummy bugs, description, Hedgie is a small hedgehog measuring three inches big, brown quills, etc. Biography, okay, then the drabble, today is the day. I got to double check if that's 100 words. That looks like a little too much. He brought to himself as he stood at the edge of the top. He thought to himself as he stood at the edge of the top stair, his brown eyes filled with determination as they looked around at the obstacles on every other step that stood in his way to reach the first floor. Kind of a run-on sentence, but we're getting the idea. He jumped, curling into a tight ball and rolling down the flight of stairs, picking up a misplaced sock and colorful pom-poms, which stuck onto his brown quills. He uncurled almost 
at the end of the stairs, shaking his quills to shed off the extra weight, but froze as a familiar melody followed by a soft humming caught his attention. He ran quickly to the edge of the stair, peeking through the wooden column. His heart beat fast in his ears as his eyes fell on the moving black disc, the one his human called Roomba. His noise, his nose picked up the familiar warm, sweet scent that filled the air, brown eyes finding the tray with cookies left out to cool on the kitchen counter. So close, he thought to himself, as he jumped down one more stair, eyes looking all around for a possible safe route. So close. So there you go. In a hundred words or so, we have this story about uh, this character, Hedgy the Hedgehog. We've got this conflict, the evil old Roomba doesn't let him get his cookies. And then the world, I think the world could be refined a little bit more. I'm not getting a big sense of like where this is taking place. It seems like in a house, I guess, because there's stairs and stuff. But there's one possible example. Let's see another one. Um, Buster is the character, nicknamed Buster Boy, B-Boy, age 10, male from San Diego, based off my dog, and events are based on a true story. Buster is a medium-sized black lab pit mix who is very energetic and always in a happy mood. Travel. Adopted as a pup by a military veteran, for a year he lived with the veteran for a year. Unfortunately, the vet was still in the military. He had to leave poor Buster home alone. When the vet noticed how fast Buster was going, was growing, and how energetic he was getting, he decided to put Buster up for adoption. That's sad. A nice lady who lived in an apartment was the person who adopted Buster. Unfortunately, Buster wasn't fit for an apartment, so he lived there for a week. Luckily, my mom saw the lady, put Buster up for adoption, and she adopted him. Now Buster has lived with us for nine years and counting. All right, so we have a character. We have a uh, background of the character. We have the conflict. And then the resolution, happy ending. So there's one. Uh, here's another one. Cecile, a dragon alicorn mix. Hometown is Little Hope. Favorite food, raw meat and black pudding. Okay, the drabble. Uh, Cecil or Cecil, Cecile. Cecil opened her eyes to a big surprise. All the girls in the room were gone, meaning she was late for the morning chores. As she readied her clothes, while running down the stairs, Cecile noticed the girl surrounding something in awe. Our lucky girl has finally awoken, said Mother Mariah, wearing a big smile. Isn't it pretty? Standing amidst the crowd was a child, childish doll somewhere around her height wearing a long white dress. We have found the perfect suitor for you. May God bless your union. Cecile runs over to embrace her. But Mother, she says as te tears fall from her eyes, I just turned ten. There we go. We have a, an evocative environment, character, plot, conflict, kind of a cliffhanger ending. That's kind of interesting. You can do that too. If you feel that within your hundred words, you haven't quite gotten the whole plot, you can kind of do a cliffhanger to be continued sort of thing. I wouldn't really write to be continued, but you could end it in a way that feels like to be continued. Or if you have an idea that is beginning, middle, and end within the hundred words, great. You can do that. And everyone kind of works on projects like that. So one more and then I'll go on. So highly near weather, nickname Sailor Comet from Virginia Beach. Life pre-reincarnation. Life on the Earth colony of Meteor Prime was quiet and occasionally punctuated with the arrival of Earth and Moon politicians. Life in the modern era, Haley is a first-year college student when the, she's contacted by the International Sailor Scouts Organization to resume her duty as a scout to fight against evil. And the story, Haley Nearweather has been tailing the lieutenant of the Impact Court, Damascus. They want to return to Earth to its glory days back before the Crystal Empire agitating the junctures of magical ley lines in order to render all modern technology useless, they will assert their leader as supreme empress in the case. Haley has him cornered when he turns on her smug. Damascus says that she won't hurt him, revealing that he's been daylight, daylighting as her closest friend and confidant, Daniel. She announces that she doesn't need anyone in a flurry of tears destroying the promise ring Daniel had given her and running away. To be continued. 
see it doesn't have to literally end on to be continued, but I want to know what's coming up next. You might not be able to encapsulate your whole story in such a short amount of space. And again, the challenge of this assignment is it's got to be 100 words. I will, you know, select your words and right click and count it. And I will check. And if it's 102 words, that's not what I asked for. And that's to simulate in the real world. It's not about a grade. It's about doing the job. And so that constraint hopefully breeds creativity. So instead of using two words to describe something, what if you find the perfect word, the perfect synonym that is one word? So that's part of the challenge of the assignment to kind of think outside the box. All right, so those are some examples of that assignment. They did the same thing that you did. And then I'll pull up examples of the storyboard. Let's see, storyboard. All right, so on this assignment here, we've got on this submission here, so we've got the four, we've got the eight storyboards. Just looking at it visually, they drew simple shapes. They added a little bit of color to also show other aspects of the animation that will eventually come together. Then there's explanation in the text. Opening scene, there's background. The background moves to the left. There's a motion tweak. We're going to learn how to animate things in a variety of ways. One type of animation is known as a motion tween. As a motion tween, Bunny enters... Bunny enters scent jumping. Scene. Bunny enters the scene jumping. Little camera icon. We're going to see how we can use Adobe Animate to kind of move a camera around in an environment. Really cool. So we will zoom in as a pan. Bunny sees carrots sprouting. So there's going to be carrots on the ground. The bunny, the camera moves towards the carrots. There's a motion tween here. It pulls out a carrot. So notice we don't have to write here the exact, every detail of things about, well, how did it get from the character looking at the carrots to now standing to pull out a carrot? We don't have to have all that detail. Um, we have the concept of establishing, looking at something of the plot and then something else happening without having to have the in-between because you've only got eight spots here. And even though I said, yeah, you can turn in three or five or 10 of them, I guess, you know, don't go overboard. You don't have to show every detail of things, but show the big ideas of what you're eventually going to draw, which are eventually going to animate. And this is also going to show you, I've got these great, huge ideas, but the deadline is two weeks. Can I do it in two weeks? This is also to kind of show you, not your limitations, but you have that ultimately these deadlines. And yes, I take late work, but ultimately I, the class will end and I won't be able to take work after the class ends, even though you've got this amazing idea that's coming together very slowly. Part of the challenge of the class, which is a challenge in real life as well, is deadlines. Those of you that are gamers, and most of you are probably gamers, you might keep up to date with this game's been delayed. This new DLC is running late. There's a patch on day one because there's a big bug and then they had to release the game. So deadlines are always a challenge. They're going to be a challenge, especially when you are the only person that is making the animation or the game, whereas these games and animations out there in the real world are made by dozens of people and even they run late. Even they have bugs and all of that. So consider that you're the only one working on this project. So it continues, camera zooms, lift carrot in victory. Fox sees Bunny from afar. Fox is furious. Bunny stealing from crops. Motion background, move background to the left. Motion tween, the chase begins. Motion tween, Bunny enters corn maze. So this is as far as it goes for the story-wise, based on the drabble, based on the storyboard. Eventually, this will get animated, and then it segues into a game. 
There's a game that is then comes later in the class where, well, what happens next? Now it's going to be a game. So again, this class in the totality of it all, we have, we're building a lot of portfolio pieces, right? Characters, animation, uh, characters, model sheets, storyboards, scripts, the actual animation, a game, practice with interactivity. It's a lot coming together. Let's see another example, randomly picking. So on this one, we see here, this one was printed out, drawn on regular paper pencil. So a scene set up, someone about to race on your mark. The race gun, whatever it's called, goes off, ready to go. A scene of running. There's a rock there, probably important for the plot. Whoops, we trip and fall and crash and start to get up. And then we start to run again, and then we get to the end, and we win. So, okay, amazing plot here, and now visualized into a um, storyboard. Now, as usual, grading-wise, I am grading on the technical aspect of things. I don't grade on the artistry of things, because that is a harder thing to grade. I am grading on the technical aspects. Did you follow the instructions? Did you submit things as were necessary? It's up to you to some degree as well about the effort that you do to these things. But the more effort, the more you put into it, the better you're off, the better off you are because then your ideas come together a lot better. It looks more professional as well. So on this one, we have a title screen, incorporeal. There's a sound of ghostly wailing at the beginning here. Then we, the character Tom wakes up in the abandoned house in a daze. Green light shines through a crack in the door music. Uh, what did that say? Waltz of death, waltz to death. So light emanating. Tom enters the door and gets sucked through a portal. Tom's face drags across the floor as he fl flies out the portal. He disheveled, hair is disheveled. Now, whenever you uh, write stuff, make sure I can read it. Uh, it helps me as well, not only you. And then scary stuff in the shadows, and then there's light over there, and more music changes over here, music changes over there. We meet these characters, and in the end, Tom introduced to Incorporal Co. and meets the crew. Right. So that one looks like it was drawn. What does that look like? Drawn on paper? No, that was probably drawn in Animate. And also probably yeah, drawn in animate. So visiting a someone. Title page. Something background. Daytime. Walking towards tree. There's a breeze. Rock and bush foreground. Looking down. Getting closer to us. Wind from the right. Looks up. Sad. Sad-ish smile. Some background. Wind and so forth. So here, very sketchy view, text explaining things. You see it's very open-ended what you can do with these storyboards, partly for me to give you feedback. Um, this makes sense. This might be hard to animate. This is a good idea. Expand on this, et cetera. I'll give you some feedback on the work as well as for you to kind of put your ideas out that'll eventually be animated. Because in that 100 words, you may have this amazing galaxy spanning epic, but ultimately it'll come down to then, can you make that amazing galaxy spanning epic when you have to get down and actually do the work? So we'll have the lab time and such, and maybe you're working on your own as well. But the aspects of these two assignments come together 
to help kind of create the boundaries of your assignment. There's some examples. I can show more later if you want to see more examples. But um, those are the two assignments this week. Script and the storyboard. So um, questions again on these assignments for the moment? Wrap up for the week. So we've got the uh, biography and the storyboard stuff to work on, which creates a backstory for your character, for your animation. Uh, show us a series of scenes that eventually you're going to work on to animate as we learn more. Um, I've got all of these um, videos that will be required for you to watch sometime this week. Um, and if you then follow the, the tips of uh, versus bad character animation, you can get up to five points extra credit if, we, if you redo your first turnaround model sheet assignment. If you redo that based on the new knowledge, resubmit it. You just have to reply to yourself in the discussion. I think what will also be good is, let me write it here, reply to yourself and then also send me a message on the inbox that you did it because it might not fully alert me. So just to make sure, resubmit it to your message me via the inbox up to five points. That's half of an assignment there. And um, she can say, okay, yeah, we can discuss those questions in a bit after we have a little bit more time. Very good. You can send that question to me. Uh, you can send it to me right now as a private message. If you select my name and send it to me there that way, we can uh, talk about that in a bit. So anyway, here, people can do this, get some extra credit if you redesign your character after you watch that video. The next week, we'll begin CIS 126. Still plenty more to learn, the actual animation of things, which we'll start working on this week. But it's all coming together. There's some big, cool projects, little by little. We're going to take our first break. Then um, we're going to do a little lecture and then a little work and then so forth. So it's 12.50. Take a short break until 1 o'clock. Um, if you want to take a break and such, or start to look at some of these um, some of these videos, we'll look at them later. But let's take a little break until one, and then we'll go on in a bit. I'm trying, but we have more money to. So let's let's check my email right now, actually. Someone. So in person, go check with um, our contact person. Is that Coraima? She's the one that usually. Do you have any of her emails recently? I also don't think I got anything or they missed me again. The email that I have from her is from the 15th, which is already 10 days.
Our teams have been submitted for U3. Well, the start date, start date is July 1st. So hmm, we might be about if there's a possibility to backtrack that within the amount of time you've already been here, but it seems that at least starting forward from here, and how about a little bit mm -hmm. lab time and such, we could try to catch her in person and then see about if there's a funding or possibility or in any of it to have counted for these first week. And she only sent it to me, which is weird. So latest on that, that's her latest email on that. But again, we'll try to catch her in person and iron out the details.
All right, everyone, let's go on. So um, let's start to look at some aspects now of Adobe Animate, the animate part of Adobe Animate. So far, we've been using it to draw, whether characters or backgrounds and the like. But eventually, we're going to have some amount of animation. Now, I will say, spoiler alert, and I will also show examples from previous students, you're not going to make the next Pixar movie. You're not going to make the next Miyazaki movie. You're not going to make the next streaming series. You're going to, within the amount of time that we have here, however, you will make something interesting, something animated, something yours, something unique, because all of those big famous shows and uh, movies and all that stuff is a huge endeavor full of a room full of people working on it seven days a week. And it's just going to be you. And you're not going to have the budget and the time like the big players. You're going to have the deadlines of this summer. And this summer comes by faster than you think. So um, within what we're going to do here, you'll be able to do cool things. But then... Um, just keep in mind on the deadlines there. Before we get started, did you need a drawing pad? You need a drawing pad? All right, so the way we're going to start to look at this is one of the simplest things to animate a bouncing ball. We are going to look at a couple of ways that this is done. The most basic way to give you a sense of how does this software work, number one. Then a little bit more complexly, how do we do this so that it looks more, slightly more realistic and such. So we're going to start a brand new animate project. I'll go with the full HD preset. So just create a new file, go with full HD save this file. I usually like to press, as soon as my file opens up, I like to press control two so that it automatically zooms in and out to a size that I like. Control two on the keyboard fills it up in a nice way. And I'm gonna save this. So you're gonna save your work. You can call it week four or today's date or whatever you want. This is another one of these, most of these files that we work with in class are just practice files. You don't have to keep them if you don't take them home with you. It's not nothing you have to turn in, but you often want to keep these for you to kind of show your evolution of your of your work. But I'm going to save this somewhere. The desktop should be fine, or if you've got a flash drive or whatever. get in the habit of creating folders to, to save your work in, not just save it directly to the desktop. It is a little better to create a project folder and then put your projects in the project folder for various reasons, which we'll cover later, but get in the habit of making folders and then files, project files in those folders. So we have a basic simple document. I said control two is very useful to alter your zoom so that you see things just right. And then um, I would also recommend change your background color, your stage color, change the, um, change the sheet of paper from instead of it just being bright white to anything else because that way it will help you avoid issues later on. Like I said last time, like if you need to color the eyes of your character white, you're going to forget that they're not white. And then when they walk in front of a tree, you're going to see through the eyes. So change it to anything, any other color. I'll just go with like an off gray, off white gray, any color you want. Change the name of layer one to ground or floor or background or whatever. With the line tool, setting it at any color, any size, anything you want, just going to make the floor. Created a world where there was nothing. Now there's a floor. There's a world. Here's the part where be careful. 
as we've seen before, uh, you probably don't want the object drawing mode on. Uh, I believe as soon as these turn, as soon as you start animate, it doesn't have it on. So just make sure that's not on. And probably the snap feature will get in our way. So to find the snap feature, you want to go to the selection tool, turn off the little magnet, snap, turn it off. It is useful several times, and I'll show you when to turn it on. But for the moment, let's turn it off. So I've got here the ground. I'm going to lock that layer, make a new layer, call it ball version one, ball v1. And notice here, if it hasn't, if you haven't seen it before, it might have popped up for you about how to name these things. So, for example, spaces are not allowed. So special characters are not permitted. And that simply means no spaces. And that'll be more important later on when we work with interactivity, when we uh, make games and such. Uh, interactivity, when we get to that part, will require some amount of code. And code has to be done in a very specific way. Uh, many coding languages are different enough from a regular human language that you have to remember all of these details. And one of them is no special characters on your layers. So that is just telling me you can put no spaces or you can put underscore or whatever. So I've got a layer for a ball. I the, the big idea that I want to get across is animation is based on um, frame rate. Animation is a series of drawings, slightly different from each other. Smoother animation has more drawings. Choppier animation has less drawings. But less drawings doesn't mean bad, and more drawings doesn't mean good. Smoother and choppier, sure, we can have a value judgment there. I want my animation smooth, so I need more drawings. That's not a thing to consider, really. And the opposite, oh, less drawings is choppier? I don't want that. I want smooth animation. Well, don't equate that one is better than the other. They are artistic choices. They give you different results. One is not better than the other. As a beginner, you kind of want to lean towards less drawings. Because I'm a beginner. I'm learning the software. I'm trying to get better at this. I'm, I'm the only one making my, my project. And instead of drawing 50 drawings, if I can get away with 40 drawings, 40 frames, then I can do it. So first of all, our project here is set up at 30 frames per second. The default was 30 frames. If you don't see, if you don't see, where's my frame rate? This again, the part of even just working before you do anything in your project is just even knowing how your interface works. So if I just want to change my default frame rate, um, either by selecting uh, the properties of the document or maybe with the select tool, clicking on an empty spot of the document, there's several ways to do the same thing. What are the properties of this document? Well, I want to go at 24 frames per second change that to 24. 24 frames per second at the minimum is a very good speed for even the most professional animation that you're going to see at a movie theater or on TV, 24 frames per second. Higher frame rates will be smoother, but we don't need that much uh, frame rate, especially as a beginner. And if I have the wrong dimensions of my project, here's a spot where I can also change it. Now, as I said, animation is a series of drawings. Did any of you ever play with a flip book when you were little or recently, where you, you have a, a little book and you kind of flip through it and, it and there's a little drawing on each page and you flip through it and it looks animated. There's a little kid jump roping or a dog flipping or whatever. So flip books. The idea there is that on one page, you've got a drawing and the next page, it's slightly different. 
on the next page, it's slightly different, slightly different. When you flick through it, when you flip through it, it creates the illusion of animation. Animation lines changing over time. In anime, we have this panel that we've looked at this whole semester so far, this timeline panel, where it's saying I have 24 frames per second frame rate. I'm on frame one, the current frame. And then I have all of these frames, infinite frames, delineated by the uh, marker of one second, two seconds, et cetera. And it's basically, in my case, multiples of 24. Right there, this is frame 24, which is one second. Right here is frame 48, which is two seconds. And then uh, what's after 48, 30, uh, 32 or so, 36 or something? That's my third frame. So here, I have one frame. And I said previously that all of the shapes and colors of everything has a specific meaning. Here I have this light gray square versus this dark gray square. Here I have a black circle versus an empty circle. So what this is telling me is this is a frame that has something on screen, the black dot. This is a frame that has nothing on screen. It's not filled in. If I were to draw something there, now it becomes filled in because it's telling me there's something on screen. Notice the colors change very subtly. So the complication is I've got to deal with layers and frames. Later on, we'll also deal with scenes. A lot of complication to deal with. But so far, my ground exists on one frame for one 24th of a second. I want this ground to exist for one whole second. So this frame needs to exist, needs to extend all the way to 24 frames. So click on frame 24 on your ground layer, right click, and then you have insert frame. Keyboard shortcut F5. You want to memorize that as soon as possible, F5. Now my timeline shows, okay, you have a keyframe on frame one, which extends all the way to frame 24. It ends there. If I draw, don't do this yet, but if I draw a circle, a ball, shows on one frame, the ball exists and then the ground exists for one second. We're gonna get used to our button on top here, test movie, which is the same as control enter on the keyboard. Uh, are we going to have to submit this bouncy ball? No, this one is gonna be for practice, but it's going to be very useful for the future assignments. So at this point, if I test my movie, okay, I have this blinking ball. Again, don't draw this just yet. I'm just showing here. We have this ball that is blinking here at the moment for one, one twenty-fourth of a second. The ground is visible for the whole second, but the ball is visible for just a moment because obviously that's what my timeline is saying here. Again, don't do anything just yet. But if I were to also right-click insert frame or F5 on the keyboard, now this is saying the ball exists from frame one to frame 24. And if I were to test this movie, control enter, it all is visible at all times. But I'm gonna undo that. I don't wanna do anything yet. I'm trying to get the point across that things that are gonna appear on screen have to exist in a frame within your timeline of some amount of time, something will be visible for one or more frames. You want to get used to having different elements on their own layers. And um, you have to think in many perspectives. We have a cool link here in the chat. Let me pull that up briefly. This is a flipbook animation after the ad, of course. Let's see what is this. So here's a, this is what I'm talking about, a flip book. Anyone ever uh, 
seen any of these. It's a bunch of pieces of paper, then you flip through it and you got right there, Tom and Jerry battling. Drawings add up together as you flip through it at some speed, then the animation happens. So there you go, Tom and Jerry. Flip through it slowly, slower frame rate. You flip through it faster, faster frame rate. That's it. But this is basically animation. Drawings change a little bit at a time. Cool. Thank you for that. So in our project over here, we're going to make a ball bounce. So instead of drawing it by hand, and this never works, we're going to use uh, a tool here. We've got rectangle tool. We've got oval tool. Notice how some of these tools have a little triangle in the corner. That means there's more tools hidden inside of this tool. You need to kind of open up this drawer. And this is common in the other Adobe apps as well. But here we on our rectangle tool, click and hold it. We have oval tool. Don't select, don't select oval primitive. Go just with oval tool. That's got a keyboard shortcut of O, R for rectangle. See the shortcuts are here on the side. Oval tool. The oval tool has a fill, has a stroke, inside color, outside color, plus a size. So pick any colors you want. size and stroke and so forth. Here's a little animation tip. If you have lines of different sizes, that helps you create depth. In a completely simple animation like this, size of the ball, yes, but the thickness of the stroke also gives you a sense maybe that it's big, it's closer to the camera, that sort of thing. If I have a smaller line size, yeah, and the smaller ball as well. But even that, just the sizes of your strokes, the sizes of the edges of, of things, there's no, like, conceptually, uh, one looks like it's closer to us than the other. Here, even just by simply altering the stroke, Obviously, if one is on top of the other, then it gives even more of the illusion of one is closer to us and such, but just the sizes of strokes, that's a trick there. Just put it 11, 10, something like that. And then draw a, uh, a ball somewhere above the ground. Now, if you want a perfect circle, hold down shift, Since I drew this with the uh, oval tool, this creates two things. It creates a fill, an inside shape, and it creates a stroke, an outside shape. Click once on the stroke to select it and then move it. And click once on the inside to select it and move it. If I click and drag something like that, independent objects, that when they overlap, they kind of intersect and do interesting things to each other. It's just something to play with and practice, but back to a circle, circle. Animation, little changes over time, smoother animation, more drawings per frame rate. We're working at 24 frames per second. And we're also gonna be working with the concept of drawing or animating in twos. Every drawing will exist for two frames. Instead of every drawing existing for one frame and you have to draw 24 frames for one second, we only have to draw two frames, uh, which will be 12 in this amount of time and still get pretty smooth animation. So I want this starting point of the ball to exist for two frames. So clicking on 
my current frame here, pressing F5, which is the same as right click, insert frame. F5, that shows it for two frames. Show the drawing for two frames without any change. Basically, wherever the black dot is, is some drawing, often a change. And wherever there's no dot but gray, it means it's the same drawing, but with no change. That makes sense on the ground. We drew the ground on frame one, no change for one second. And now I want to make some change on the ball. I want to move it a little bit downwards. It's falling down, actually. So frame three, right, wherever you click on these, it will show what frame number you're on. Frame three, right click, insert keyframe. It doesn't show it on the um, on the right click, but that's the same as F6. That's kind of weird that your right click shows you all of these shortcuts. No, there it is there. No, this is convert to keyframe. Uh, okay, yeah, that's close enough. Either convert or insert keyframe. So F6, insert keyframe. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move the ball downwards a little bit. Now, again, be careful here. If I just click and drag it, whoops, I only move the inside. This is made out of an inside and an outside shape. So you want to get used to double clicking. That will select both the inside and the outside. I want to move the ball downwards a little bit. Down some amount. If we want to, we can set exact coordinates. Notice there on the right side, it's telling me exactly what pixels down to fractions of a pixel. So you can do this exactly perfectly. No need to be exactly perfect at the moment. Just move it down some amount. You know, if you kind of move over to the edges accidentally, you could hold shift on the keyboard and move it exactly perfectly in line. Perfect angles, holding shift. If you don't hold shift, you might shift it over a, a little bit. Move it down. You can also use on the keyboard, once you've selected your object, you can use the keys on the keyboard to move it a little bit at a time, perfectly on the keyboard. Hold shift plus arrows to move it around. So there's like often 10 ways to do the same thing, which on the one hand, it's, well, there's just so many ways to do it. I'm never going to memorize it. You don't have to memorize them all. You just learn the one that is useful to you and keep doing it that way. And if you want shortcuts, then you can further learn how to um, find the keyboard shortcuts and the tips and tricks. All right, so I'm gonna jump over two frames. Five, press F6. It automatically filled in an empty, it, it automatically filled in a, a frame created a new keyframe. So wherever there's a keyframe, basically there's some change. Now I'm gonna move it down again. Easiest way for me is shift and then down arrow a couple times, two or three times, doesn't matter how much, just move it down a little bit. Jump over two more frames, I'm on frame seven now. Press F6 again. Down a little bit more. Jump over two more frames, F6. It's going to touch the floor. Starting to animate my playhead here as I pull it back and forth. Shows the movement, the dropping of this object. Press play here, it plays it one time. If I press enter on the keyboard, it plays at one time. If I press better yet on the top right, test movie, which is the same as control enter on the keyboard, it'll play it as normal. There it is falling, it disappears. Of course, what my timeline is showing, this ball is visible only from frames one to nine. Just to kind of round it off on frame 10 here, I'll press F5. So two and two and two and two and two. There's one, two, three, four, 
five keyframes. The black dot is a keyframe. There is one frame, one unchanging frame, then a changing frame, no change, yes change, no change, yes change, no change, yes, no. There's a change, no change all the way to the end here. Test it, obviously, then there's the change. It's falling, it's moving. Okay, well, if it hit the ground, and now it's time to bounce back up. So I need a new change, a new keyframe, right-click, insert frame, or a keyframe, or F6. So now I'll start to move the ball upwards with the mouse, with the keyboard, some amount upwards. Jump two frames later, F6. Move it up again, some amount. Jump two frames, F6. Move it up. There's two frames there. Question. Um, what's the difference between like what you're doing now and then adding layers and placing those moments? It's often better to have every element on its own layer. Animation can get very weird, especially when you do tweens, which is let the computer do it for me. Right now I'm doing it manually. The computer can do it for me if we set it up right, but then it's better when it's on separate layers. And even for myself, if I'm doing it manually myself, I could do this all on one, on one layer, but it really is better from experience to put every element on its own layer that needs to change. So I could have a bunch of palm trees and maybe the palm trees are waving around. I would put the palm trees on their own layer. I would put the sand of the beach on its own layer and then animation can happen on its own layer. It's just better to separate them to separate layers. All right, so I'm gonna test this. I'm gonna go to that test button on the top. I'm gonna control enter. Ooh, bouncing ball. Looks a little choppy, sure. Maybe when I moved it down, I accidentally moved it two pixels to the left so it's not perfectly aligned, sure. But the point of what I'm trying to show here is you have to, you know, the, the, the journey of a, a, the journey of a, what's the slogan? The journey of a hundred miles begins with the first step. And here's our very first steps, learning these concepts of the importance of objects on their own layers, the importance of what's a keyframe, What's a regular frame? The importance that frames are basically when something changes, even if it's just moving a little bit on screen. And um, you have this kind of movement. Now let's say in my case, I uh, had said, let's make 24 frames here. And there's all of these empty frames, right? Well, obviously, because this is empty, nothing is further happening. Well, it's reached the top, let's say, and it's going to come down again. So insert keyframe F6, down again, skip two, F6, move it down again. The idea. So Make it go back down again. Not very smooth, not very convincing, kind of robotic. That's okay. We'll, we'll keep practicing and make this smoother and better because in this week's um, in this week's um, resources, I have videos, as I said, from this YouTube channel, BAM Animation. Oh, actually, this one's not from BAM. This is from a different YouTuber. But there's 12 principles of animation. This one's long, 24 minutes. This is an amazing video that explains the 12 principles of animation. Now. Uh, animation, this, this invention 
of animation, the history of it, just like everything, is very interesting. And you can go like a hundred years ago on the first animations. Animation's been on a while. And even like the most primitive, you can go back to like the 1700s and find kinds of animation. Well, cameras didn't even exist then and movie projectors and TV, how is that? If you look at the history of this stuff, there were these interesting inventions that made these kinds of animations like 200 years ago. But the animations we know nowadays, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and My Hero Academia and all of that, it's on a modern type of animation with, of course, newer technology. But even back just about 100 years ago, 80 years ago, they already had invented the ideas that would go on for the next 100 years of how to make good animation. There's 12 principles. There's a video for you to check out on your own. It's a really good one where they explain every one of the principles. And it's not like you have to do all 12 of them to do a good animation. But the more of these that you know and incorporate, the, the better, the more realistic, the smoother your animations will be. One of them, for example, is called squash and stretch. In classic animations of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Bugs Bunny and all of them, Tom and Jerry, you really see it on that style of animation. Uh, even on the modern styles, um, Adventure Time and Gumball and all of that, with a lot of American style, you still use this style. And even anime style, they use these various principles, like squash and stretch. My hand, for example, here, if I move my hand, if I hit this thing here, um, it, it looks realistic because I'm a person, right? But if I wanted to animate this to kind of really give it a sense of uh, this is a realistic type of animation, there's a technique, squash and stretch, where my hand hits this thing and it maybe vibrates a little. It, the impact, if I wanted to really sell it that I hit this really hard as an animation, it would shake. My hand would also kind of like deform or do a type of animation as it hits that. Whereas in the real world, from your distance, this didn't shake at all when I tapped it and such. If you were even nearby here, you might have seen it vibrate a little. But these principles kind of take these ideas of the real world and exaggerate them a little bit. And the funny thing about animation is the more real, if you want more realism, you actually have to exaggerate a little bit than the real world, kind of as counterintuitive. But depending on the level of exaggeration and the type of animation and such, a little exaggeration makes it more realistic. This ball doesn't really look realistic. And the animation of it needs more work. We're going to redraw this with one of the techniques, the squash and stretch technique, to make it slightly more realistic. So on our layers here, double click your ball one layer or right click it, double click the uh, icon, and it's the same as right click properties. Shortcut if you double click it. Let's um, change this to lock it, turn it invisible, and turn it into a guide. That stiff animation was okay, but I just want to lock it and hide it away to draw version two. So lock it, invisible, guide it. Layer. Call this ball V2. Now, notice here, this is, a, this, is, this is what happens by default on Animate. When we first created our project, we had frame one. When we created a second layer, we had frame one, second layer. Now that I've done a little bit of work on my project, 24 frames, and I've added a new layer, it very helpfully, but sometimes not so helpfully, creates a layer, it's empty, it's an empty dot, but it extended that layer all the way to the end, which I don't really want. This is trying to help us. This is a layer that's gonna be visible all the way to the end because you've got an animation that's 24 frames. So let's help you. That is not actually helping us. We only wanna start with the one frame. So making a frame, we've seen we can right click, insert frame, insert keyframe. Sometimes we need to remove frames. That's what we need to do now. So if you make a selection, if you click and drag to make a selection, to all the frames that we don't want. And you can start from right here and drag back, or you can start from here and drag back. 
I don't want all of these frames that it helpfully made for us. Right click and remove frames. We have clear frames, remove frames, insert frames, blank frames, all of this complex stuff. Remove frames, shift F5. We select, so now we've only got one frame. So again, you can select frames, shift F5 or right click, remove frames. That's what I want. One starting frame on ball version two. I'm gonna draw a ball, maybe different colors just to differentiate it from what I did a moment ago. Oval, draw a ball. Okay, so squash and stretch. The idea is when things move, they slightly and subtly deform. Like my hand just swatting like that, my hand will always be exactly the same hand. But have you ever seen videos of like fighter pilots in an airplane flying really fast and their faces all deforming because the G-forces are just like warping their faces? Um, or like if you uh, if you're getting sprayed with like a, an air hose or a water hose, your face deforms because the your your the, your your face is just being uh, pushed by the material. Well, in animation, we have the power to do that in subtle or or obvious ways. But as this falls, I want the force of gravity to slightly stretch out the ball. Gravity is pulling down on it, and again, exaggeration makes something more realistic. So in the real world, if I drop that round ball, I'm not going to notice it altering at all. In a microscopic level, it will. But on an animation level, with some exaggeration, it becomes more realistic. So I'm going to jump two frames over. Frame three, F6. I'm going to move the ball down a little bit. And then I'm also going to, with the uh, select tool, Pull it a little bit down, pull it a little bit up. How much? Don't worry about it just yet, but I'm going to now start to stretch it out a little bit as an oval. Keyframe one, it's perfectly round. It starts to fall. Stretch it out slightly, move it down slightly. Jump two frames over, F6. Move it down some amount. Stretch it out a little bit more. I'm just using the plain old selection tool. Grabbing the edge, stretching it down. F6, further down. More stretch. Jump two frames, F6. I think at this point I'll have it near the ground now. Stretch it a little bit. Is I is known as scrubbing the playhead as you just move it back and forth like this. You're getting a sense that it's moving, that it's stretching, it's deforming. We're doing it in a kind of obvious way. And even realistic animation styles have some form of squash and stretch to them, as well as other, uh, as well as the other 12 principles of animation. Jump over six. Jump over two frames, F6. Now, gravity is pulling down on this, stretching it out slightly. Now it's going to hit the ground. The ground is solid. The ground's going to stop the movement. So this is stretch, squash and stretch. This is stretch. Now we have squash. Now the opposite. Now we're going to animate a few frames of it squashing because it hit a solid ground. And so that longer shape is going to squash down a little bit. So it hit the ground here. Now we're doing it here kind of the wrong way. We'll have better ways, of course. Um, now I'm going to start to pull out the, the edges of it. Whereas the force of gravity was stretching it downwards, 
when it hits the ground, it's going to kind of squash outwards for a bit. Draw this perfectly and such as we get practice, as I'll show you how. Skip two more frames, stretch out the edges a little bit over, that one down a little bit. Jump two more frames of six, squash it a little bit, a little bit more. So it's getting a little bit more character. It's getting a little bit more life rather than the mechanical, just move it down X pixels. Now it's moving downwards. It's got this subtle amount of change in movement. It's hitting the ground. It's squashing out. Okay, now we go the opposite. Now it's going to bounce back up. So once it's hit the ground, Jump two frames, F6. Um, up a little bit. Start to change the shape of the thing. Six. Here again, I'm using the keyboard. It's a little easier. It's a precise shift up. So now here, whereas when it was falling before, the force of gravity was stretching the object downwards. Now its own force of kinetic energy, I guess, after hitting the ground and bouncing back up, its own force, its own, its own self propelling itself is also going to do this stretch aspect of it. Six, move it up more, form it some amount. Now, there are, of course, many tricks and things to learn. For example, right now we're kind of doing this very blind in terms of here's my drawing, here's the next drawing, here's the next drawing. There is a way, of course, to see what was my previous drawing so that I can know where to draw my next drawing. I hadn't shown you that yet, but of course there's a way to do that. Um, and that is by activating this feature known as onion skinning. See all of these icons here right above your timeline. One of them right here, onion skinning, selected range. It's got its own keyboard shortcut that I never remember. But if you activate this icon here, onion skinning, then it gives you a sort of a starting point and an ending point by moving this, these boundaries here. So after you turn on onion skinning, it'll show you a previous frame, a future frame, wherever your current playhead is at. So if I was trying to draw this, if I was trying to draw this new change in my animation, maybe I turn on onion skinning to show me what it had looked like a frame ago or you know several frames ago. So it kind of previews it there, kind of looking like Neo is dodging agent, whatever his name is from the matrix. You can kind of see all of these, uh, Agent Smith, right? All of these angles by turning on onion skinning. You can see the before, you can see the after. Just the temptation to have it show you like 10 frames ahead and 10 frames in back. You don't really need to see that many, maybe three or four or so. But you can alter that to show you before and after. That way, then now you know exactly where to draw the next frame, add the next frame, turn that on or off. It's a guide, yeah, it's a very- 
Uh, yes, that, right? exactly. When you when you when you do the test movie, it doesn't show it. So it's only there to show you before and after where the frames are at. Now, here, what I've been drawing so far, and you don't have to have the exact frames that I do, but the way I've done mine that I've been kind of suggesting here, right? We're doing frame, uh, keyframe, frame, keyframe, frame, over and over and over. At, in my case, I ended up that I've got two more frames at the very end here. Well, to kind of, when you want to do a looping animation, basically your first frame and your last frame are the same or similar, that way the loop looks good. What I'm trying to do here is, okay, it started here, it bounced down, it bounced back, and then it's going to get back to this starting point here. Well, in any of these frames that you draw, you can duplicate frames, you can duplicate what's on the frame, you can do this many ways. But for example, this starting frame, I want it to be the same as the ending frame or so. And so if I start with the starting frame, right click, copy frame, go to my end here, right click paste frame, So starting frame, end frame is the same. And it looks like it was purposefully looped because the final frame and the end frame are the same or similar. And then between is action. Obviously here, I'm missing a frame. That's why there's a little blink, a 1 1 24th of a frame blink. F5, fill it in. Now, when I play it, still needs work, I'm learning, et cetera. But compared to the previous one, if I double click that one, just so you don't have to do this, but if you invisibilize it, lock it, guide it, and then go back to your other one, double click it, visible, unlock it, normal it, comparatively mechanical. Maybe I want that. Maybe I do want a mechanical type of motion. Maybe it's a robot. Maybe it is a mechanical thing, and I do want a very stiff animation. That's not wrong. But what you need to know is what you need to know to make it do what you need to do. No, I wanted more of a living, bouncy creature thing with squash and stretch. Life to it, the invention of animation is amazing because it's taking these inanimate objects drawings and taking multiple copies of those drawings, flipping them or playing through them at some speed. You have this illusion of life. And this is my version one. I've never done this in my life. That feels a little bit more lifelike than the plain ball moving across mechanically, perhaps. So again, if it didn't get exactly to where you wanted it to be, this is why practice makes perfect. We're gonna do another one. I'll show you a slightly different way to do it again, just for the more practice to get used to layers, frames, et cetera, et cetera. But let me pause here. Kind of makes a little sense. Questions, comments, clarifications, anything, either here in life or here, here in the class or on chat. Any questions in chat at the moment? Chat box, any questions? Do ball version three. So this ball two, double click it, lock it, turn it invisible, turn it into a guide. Very valuable when you want to deactivate a layer, don't just hide it. Because if you were to print it out or turn it into a PNG, it would, it would then show it. 
If you want layers that want to that you really want to hide, you have to turn them into a guide. That way they're really deactivated. Layer, call it ball three. Once again, it did the same thing. It added too many frames for me. Remove those extra frames. Right click, remove frames or shift F5. Send this ball is gonna be like a little character with eyes, maybe hands or something. So like this, uh, just pick some colors. Character. Okay, just some thing to animate, a ball. Okay, so the same idea here where it's uh, going to fall, it's gonna move down and such, but I'm gonna do a little bit more precisely this time. Yeah, free transform tool, rather than just using the selection tool to push and pull, we can use that to be a little bit more precise. Um, so starting with the, uh, ball, uh, two frames over F6, this time with the selection tool, uh, with the free transform tool, I mean, free transform lets you, uh, resize the thing various ways. It lets you rotate it. Or smaller, etc. So with this tool, I'll move it downward some amount of space, maybe holding shift, move it down, and then I want to stretch it out. Now here, here's where I'm saying that now this will be a little bit more precise because notice if I if I stretch or, or if I pull up the um, the top control point here, the bottom one also changes in the, in the same proportion. Maybe you want that sometimes, where you want both the top and bottom or the left and right to move at the same way. That's why we might want to use that free transform. Uh, you can do it that only one side moves, holding down control on the keyboard. So by default, both sides will change, which I usually want. But maybe one part I want to change only, so with control on the keyboard, only that part will change. Probably want both sides. I'm also going to kind of bring him in a little bit like this. Start to move it downward, starts to stretch it. Jump two frames over, F6. Further move it down. Form it a little bit. Six downwards. Oh, the complication in all of this is it doesn't need to change in every key frame. There's there's the change. There's a couple of changes, right? There's the change in position. There's also the change in the drawing. As I've been moving it here, I've been changing both the position of the object as well as the shape of the object. But here, when it's reaching the ground, I'm no longer going to change the distortion of it. I'm just changing the movement of it. So for various effects, I might change the position as well as the distortion of the character or object. And other times, I might only change the distortion or only change the position. So on this final frame here, I'm not changing the distortion. It's going to hit the ground. Now I want to do the squash part and then the stretch out part. And here's the part where if I start to pull this down, oh, it's kind of changing in the wrong place. This is where I would hold the control. 
and only pull that top part because the ground is there. The ground is there. So the top is going to stretch downwards. It's not going to deform beyond the ground. This is when I, instead of pulling the top and the bottom, only the top control, pull it downwards. Stretch out the edges. Six, stretch out the edges. Six, now we go backwards. It hit the ground, it stretched out, squashed down at the bottom. Now it's coming back up. So we kind of do the opposite. Here maybe is where I might turn on onion skinning to see what my previous frames looked like so that I can get a sense of what my, how I might change my previous drawings. Move it up, stretch it out. We get to the top of the bounce, back to normal. Here now, even if it didn't have the face to create a character, here this has more life, there's more realism. Yeah, it takes practice. It's not going to loop perfectly the first time or the first three times or five times. It is complex. It is what you put into it, time and effort and such. So this bouncing ball animation, there's a version of it. There, I believe there was a version of it. Remember, on, was it on day one or day two when we looked at those Adobe Animate uh, tutorials built in? I think there was a bouncing ball animation there. So this is one of the simplest um, things to do, which then leads into much more complex things. All of this work here is just all practice. This is nothing to turn in. There's still more to learn, of course. But what I want to do on the last half hour of class you further want to practice this, if you want to remember up here on the, where did they put it? Help. Well, here we go. Hands-on tutorials, bounce animation. Here, there's these other tutorials from week one that you can go back to if you'd like. Oh, here it is at the bottom. There's, there's, there's their version of bouncing ball. Maybe do that. Now, this last half hour, you could play with some of those. Or remember, there's these videos that are part of this week's work. Um, if you want to, I would recommend it, but if you want to, you should stay. I'm gonna end the main lecture at this point. We'll have lab time until 2.30 and you should stay and then watch a few of these videos and um, take notes, follow along, whatever you wanna do. And then um, do any of those tutorials further on Animate if you want, and that'll be it for today. On um, Wednesday, I've got more stuff, more animation to work on and the like. And there'll be lab time there that day as well.
And uh, then you got the two assignments this week of the uh, script and the storyboard. But this is the week we're starting to look at animation aspects of animate, as well as your artistic stuff on the assignments. So I'll end the recorder at this point. Uh, stay if you want to do work. If you'd rather do it at home, that's fine. But we have the time now. You might as well do it. We've got the headphones here and tablets and everything. We'll wrap up at this point.